Hey, everybody. Welcome to Perpetual Motion, a podcast for lifelong learners who share my passion for ongoing personal growth by improving their communication skills, relationships, finances, and wellness. I'm your host, Dr. Mo Anderson, and my guest today is Laura Finney, a financial professional, speaker, and entrepreneur. Laura frequently holds professional workshops and seminars to continue helping individuals and businesses grow and achieve financial security. Financial security. It is possible. And if you want to ensure your family's financial future like I do, stay tuned. You can't say Dr. Mo ain't tell ya you the fear magnifies the consequences of failure. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Dr. Mo. Glad to be here. I'm excited to have you here. This is a topic near and dear to my heart. And uh, I know you're just the person to bring us information that we can use and start using right away to to ensure our families have a better future. I, I think that's, isn't that kind of the goal overall for people that each generation you want to do a little better? That's right. That's right. We all say it. Right. I, I want my kids to do better than I did or I want to, you know, take yeah. care of nieces and nephews better than I was. So absolutely. I hear it all the time. Right. And you say it. But what are you doing about it? Which is what we're talking about today, because those are two different things. <laughs> it's kind of yeah. like my ex is my workout right. program. <laughs> 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 Laura, let's start with with your passion for teaching others to protect their assets. You shared with me something that happened to your family around real estate that was not protected. Would you mind sharing that story again? Yes, I would. It is uh, my number one why uh, as to why I'm in this business when it comes to uh, educating financial literacy and education and what that really means and looks like. And uh, I grew up in the South suburbs of Chicago Uh, the youngest of seven children. And uh, we have a very large family. My mom and she only had two brothers, but they had large families. So, you know, it was a big group of us as as families always around each other, you know, having a lot of fun Uh, back in those days, grew up with nieces and nephews, like 17 of them. And they even went to school with me uh, because my mom hit me late in life. Uh, But then my granddad, he had uh, about 17 acres. They migrated from Mississippi. And, you know, he bought all that land, him and his brothers, and he had about 15 acres or so. And a good portion of it was farmland. Mm -hmm. And he grew vegetables that supplied the local markets. uh, And that's how he made a living. So he would provide vegetables to the local markets for the community to buy and, you know, live and eat off of. I remember being out in them fields. And, you know, we mentioned something about shucking corn the other day. And someone said, I can't believe you know what that word means. I was like, I know what it means. Yeah, Yeah, we know what that means. Um, And then when I was uh, 19, my granddad got sick. He had uh, bone cancer and my mom Mm. took care of him uh, day in and day out. And she encouraged him to get the wheel because he didn't have one. And he said, you know, I believe you and your brothers can handle it. And uh, after he passed, they couldn't handle it. They couldn't agree on what to do with the land, although it was already decided, you know, why the land was built anyway Mm -hmm. um, and why he had that there. He had built a concrete home on it. And, you know, we had horses and pigs and chickens. And so that generation didn't want to deal with that. And so my mom took over paying the taxes on the land, which was really just a few hundred dollars back then. And it was in the late 80s, mid 80s. Mm-hmm. And uh, my mom passed when I was 24. And at 24, I didn't know anything about, you know, the legal side of of what, you know, what should be happening. Uh, but none of the older adults in the family took over paying the taxes on the land. And we lost it in a tax sale. Mm. And, you know, every time I go home, I drive by the land and just see it overgrown. And, you know, it sparked a little nostalgia, but also a little anger and frustration right, as right. to why. Because being as young as I was, I didn't understand why the family couldn't come together and, and make that happen. Um, and then about three years ago, I went home and the land was gated off. As a matter of fact, it was like miles of land gated off. And, you know, when I drove past the area where I could see my grandfather's house from the road, mm-hmm. uh, as I got closer, it had been completely developed. And sitting on that land was an Amazon distribution center. 
Ooh. And Ooh. it's still there today. Ooh. That's uh, all the millions right there. Wow. Yeah. It, it, it hurts to even talk about it because I, I still think about of all the adults in the family, no one could make the decision to pay that few hundred bucks a year, regardless of what the others were doing. At least it maintained until right. we can sort through the legal aspect of it. But that's where my passion come from is, you know, educating people enough to know that if you leave in a legacy for something, then put the documentation in place to make sure those things happen the way you want them to. Wow. That's incredible. There, there's so many lessons uh, just right there from um, even, you know, and you see that a lot, particularly with undeveloped land, they tend to fight over the homes, you know, more, but when there's acreage and maybe just, you know, more land than, than home, which is a really good situation to have that it, I've actually acquired property through tax lien. And, and the people who are doing that, I mean, are not evil or anything is property that's available that was legally, you know, taken back because taxes were owed. So I just think about when we say we own something, a lot of times people don't understand, even if your house is paid for or your land is paid for if you don't pay taxes right, it's the government can take it back, right? And they will. They they and and let it sit there for years and do nothing with it, but take it from you. That's that's the wild part about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was tough. I it's can still imagine. Tough. I can imagine. Well, let's let's just dive into that a little bit more. The the legacy part that you know we started out talking about. Let's. Make sure we level set first that everyone understands the term financial legacy. What does that mean and why is it important for individuals and families to consider? Legacy is literally by person. Each person has their own definition of what a legacy means to them. For example, I have a really good friend uh, who lives in Austin and she's married but doesn't have any children. And I brought this up to her. You know, what does legacy look like to you as a person who doesn't have children? Um, and she said, you know, what I work for now goes to, you know, my nieces. I really want to take care of her when I'm not here or give her that leg up. And I think for most people, that's what legacy means, making sure those future generations have mm -hmm. some sort of leg up. It doesn't mean a handout or leaving lump sums of money to people, but it's making sure that that money can stay, that you worked hard for can stay in the family for generations to come if you position it right. It's not about passing on lump sums of money to people and expecting them to do right by it. Um, because I do have clients and situations where parents want to leave their adult children, you know, certain things and the kids are like, I don't want it. I, I don't want it. <laughs> I have my own things. I don't, I don't want that. Uh, but everybody that I know wants to leave something to someone and, and provide something that they've worked hard for mm -hmm. onto the next generation. And, and I think, too, sometimes those uh, younger people who say they don't want things also need to be educated on the value and why you might want this. You know, I have some books by authors. I, I, you know, I'm an author. And I started out 30 years ago. Some of those authors have gone on to become New York Times bestsellers, win these really big awards. And I have some of their early books that are signed. And so instead of just having books on the shelves, I made sure my boys understand, look, some of these are first editions. Some of these are signed books. When I'm gone, don't just come in here, you know, all mama's old books. I'm going to throw these away. I think there's an onus on us as well to educate them. And if they still, you know, if they still just throw them away, that's on them. But we've got to ensure that they understand the value of property, of land, of, of things that might not aesthetically be appealing to them, but can help them along the way. You nailed it. You nailed it. Um, I, you have nailed it. That is it. Because again, with this generation, be it my generation or my daughter's generation or my grandkids' generation, they don't want our things. Mm -hmm. And if they look at it as things, then they have no value. But like you said, if we educate them on why this is valuable, it may not be of interest to you, but here's the value it brings, you know, with you. I, I have a really good colleague that I work with. She put a value on her home that from the day she passes away, that home cannot be sold for a hundred years. Wow. Wow. That's, that's in her will. 
It's in her will and her trust that that home cannot be sold for a hundred years from the date of her death. That's smart. That is, that is really I had smart. never heard that before, but again, you live and learn about, again, what does legacy mean? It may not be something that her children want, but maybe her grandkids, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's about educating people on what it is that you've worked hard for or what you've collected and why it has value and can be of value for future generations to come. Absolutely. So do you recommend uh, wills and trusts as, as vehicles for maintaining this financial or preserving this financial legacy for your clients? Absolutely. It, it goes without saying it's step six in our six step process. Mm-hmm. Step, step six is protect wealth. And by protecting wealth, having the wheels and the trust in place. Um, I had a call yesterday with a client, um, single, re- recently divorced. And her daughter is 11. And I said, you know, first of all, the insurance company isn't going to pay her a lump sum of money. Um, And then when she turns 18, you don't want her to get a lump sum of money uh, because they don't know what to do with it. Uh, Because I have clients, I tell them, you're the only thing that keep me up at night. Are you not having these wills and trust in place? (laughs) Because you're doing, I think, more of a disservice because they don't know what to do with it than helping them out (laughs) by having the trust in place. And, and that be the beneficiary, it tells them what to do with that money. Mm-hmm. So you might give a stipend to someone, or you may not be able to sell that home for a hundred years, but the funds are there to make sure the taxes are paid on the house and things like that. People don't understand, you know, when we look at some of the most famous people, these recent years who didn't have wheels and trust. I and know. And, incredible. Uh, they have the best advisors money can buy. And yet, their family are in court for years and that costs money. It costs a lot of money to be in court to claim what you believe you rightfully own when I'm sure that that wasn't their intentions when they were out making all that money. Right. Yeah. A will and a trust, it's, it's a, it's a short process to go through, but man, once it's done, it's done. You don't have to do it again unless you just want to make some changes, but it's not that hard to do. It's not that expensive and it'll let your, assets be secured the way you want them to be. What, what, are, what are the reasons that your clients give you? I mean, I've had a will since I was in my early 20s. I updated it every few years. But I know so many people who don't, either because they think I don't have enough, even though you know they're working, they have a home, they have a car, they have insurance, or they just somehow don't have time. You know, they've got time to do, go off to Cancun and everywhere else, but they don't have time to do a will. These, these are the reasons that I see that I, I just don't understand because I've seen so many arguments and so much dysfunction when mom and daddy died, just siblings who loved each other so much. And now they are just tearing each other apart over a, a Honda or something. And it's heartbreaking. What What is the psychology or, or the financialology, I just made up a word. <laughs> <laughs> I like that word. <laughs> Behind not having a will. And is there a cultural thing? Are there some cultures that are more inclined or is it a mindset? That's a long question, but I'll be quiet now. I think it's both. <laughs> I think it's both. I think it's a culture thing and a mindset. I mean, when we look at our community, the black community, I mean, look at what happened to me. My grandfather had it all there. You know, he didn't make hundreds and thousands of dollars a year. Uh, You know, he had all that land and they brought it and, you know, he made a life for his family on it. And Mm. he thought his children who all got along would do what he asked them to do. And it didn't happen. Mm. And so that's number one is that we assume, and, and I share this, and that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked me that. One of my very dear friends, you know, we're having this conversation and she has her best friend who's her daughter. Um, And she's in her 20s, still in college as her executor of her estate. And I said, well, why would you do that to her? She doesn't have the experience. You know, who knows what she will be like 10, 20, 30 years from now. Mm -hmm. Is that fair that you would make it happen that way? And then so you have that end of the spectrum where people still are leaning on children to make legal decisions. Mm -hmm that they're not qualified to make. Number one, even though it might be written out. And then number two is to not have it is people don't think they have anything of value, but somebody has to clean your mess up. 
Somebody has to clean your house out. Somebody has to, you know, donate your clothes. Somebody has, everybody has to do something when you're no longer here with all of your things. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that leaves um, it up for grabs. You know, when I think about, um, I was, I went to a funeral maybe 20, 30 years ago. And this woman, the house looked like it was a Black Friday sale and everything was free with the family. Oh my. In and out, coming out with furniture, you know, I'm taking this. And I I mean, literally like the date of the funeral. I've seen it. Yeah. So it happens. And that's the important thing is that at the very least, you know, if you just put it in writing, Mm -hmm. at least, you know, you've done that part. And that way the family don't have to make those decisions on your behalf. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Good, good points. Good points. Thank you for sharing that. What are some avoidable mistakes you've observed in your client's efforts to build a financial legacy? Those who are trying to do it. And a a lot of us don't have financial literacy, either weren't taught or just didn't grasp it or, you know, just haven't been exposed. What, What are some mistakes that you see that that could be avoided? The number one thing is doing nothing. Mm -hmm. That's the number one. That's the biggest mistake you can do is nothing. And then on the other side of that, I see people um, do something and then it's like they walk away and I'll, I'll, you know, I don't need to do anything else. My social security will be there Mm -hmm. or, you know, I'll get to retire. Most people don't think about what they get up for today, except for this month. Got to pay the bills. Uh, I may be planning a trip or vacation or some Mm -hmm. outing or, you know, we live day to day or plan for, like you said, Cancun trips, right? But nobody is thinking about when I get up 10 or 15 years from now, what lifestyle do I want to have and live? And it doesn't mean you'll be sitting on the porch with a glass of lemonade and a rocking chair. Most 70 and 80 year olds are still thriving and, and have desires to do other things. Right. But most people are not planning for that because the mindset and the psychology is that I just have to get through today. And even with people who um, have financial plans, I, I have a really good friend. She's in her 50s and she told me she had a financial advisor for since she was 24 years old. But, you know, I get a statement once a year and I ask a million dollar question. So when you stop working, what do you want to do? What position do you want to be in when you no longer have to work? What would your life look like? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, I've never been asked that question before. And then I said, well, then how do you know how much to save? And she said, well, you know, we've always been told earn money, save, put it in these accounts. And, you know, when you get ready to retire, it'll all be there. I said, oh, so they didn't talk about inflation and, you know, protecting money. And, you know, maybe you need seven to 10 grand a month coming in every month when you don't have to work to maintain your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So how do we get there? And then we work backwards from there. But that's the biggest misconception is, number one, not doing nothing. Number two, not really having a plan and really talking about what that looks like. Most people will go to, you know, YouTube or find a guru to follow. But I tell them all the time, I like the idea that you're looking to do something. Mm -hmm. That's really good. That's smart. But now you have to do something to personalize it for you. Right. So that you can get exactly what you want and not lose money along the way that you can't regain back. Right. And everybody's needs are different. Their assets are different. Their goals are different. So it needs, like you said, it needs to be personalized, customized for their life. And I think a lot of people do assume that, you know, most of us think, OK, I'm going to downsize a little bit, but we still kind of want to live the lifestyle <laughs> that we have. <laughs> if we've been traveling, if we've been eating out. Or whatever, and to really think, what is that going to cost me? And and will I have enough? Because Social Security, girl, I just got my statement. I was like, yeah. (laughs) And I I have been working hard, paying into the system. Yeah. It says on their website, within 11 years, 2035, that fund will be exhausted. No. It's on their website. (sighs) And here's why. When we look at the years where we were growing up and we had jobs, Mm -hmm. there were 45 people contributing to the Social Security Fund for every one person that retired. 
Now that number is three to one. So there's only three people putting into that fund for every one person retiring. Mm -hmm. And now with the era of gig work, nobody's going to be putting money in that fund. Mm, I hadn't even thought about that. I hadn't even thought about that. And boomers, my generation, 10,000 of us turn 60 every day. Mm -hmm. And we are, you know, the millennials are the largest cohort in the workforce. But as far as retirement and uh, needing the Social Security and the government keeps talking about tapping into it, it's just really, really scary if that's going to be, if that's your plan. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get it a check from there. It is their plan. I, I talk, I spoke with a young lady um, that I went to high school with, you know, it's, it's life insurance awareness month. Next month, it'll be, you know, cancer, breast cancer awareness month. All of these months are relevant to financial planning. They really are. Because if you get hit with something that's going to affect you financially, how can you be prepared for that hit? Mm -hmm. And, um, She's my age. We went to high school together. I had posted something on Facebook about GoFundMe isn't an insurance policy. I saw right? that. <laughs> That's a good post. Yeah, I saw that on your page. Oh, gosh. Um, and she reached out to me and she lost an aunt, a mother, and, an, uh, and a niece all in 12 months. So oh, now at 57, tough. she wanted to get coverage for herself. Mm -hmm. Um and she now has Graves' disease, and she also has COPD. Wow. So she's got pre-existing conditions. And she has pre-existing conditions. And, you know, part of leaving a financial legacy is you being able to live and enjoy your life all throughout that process of getting there. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the first thing, right, is sure, to sure. enjoy and live your life to the best of your ability. But the one thing you don't want to do is be a burden to someone else who may have to take care of you later for, for some unseen medical issue. And we all could face it. No, mm -hmm. None of us are exempt from having a medical issue tap us out. And tap us out mean that we can't go to work, right? Or right. we might need some help cooking you know, or whatever for two or three months. But whatever it is, it's not you being able to live your best life at that time. So what are your options when that happens? And for her, it was like, I really don't want to leave my daughter in a bind. And even though her daughter is an adult, we don't think about what our lives could be like 10, 15 years from now. And I tell everybody, I put most of these things in place so that I know I can still take care of me like a wheel and a trust. You know, we talk about having living wheels and they speak for you when you can't speak for yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm speaking for myself now for 30 years down the road. Right. Because as much as I love my daughters, they can barely remember to go get what I asked them to bring me back while they were out at the mall or the store. God forbid I need medication help. <laughs> but then most importantly, families are not natural caregivers. Right. They, you know, they have lives and, you know, families of their own and anybody would be willing to help if mm -hmm. they had to help. But when you're talking about leaving that legacy, it's also putting yourself in a position where you can get the care you need and know that that money that was set aside to go down to the next generation or that asset will mm -hmm. still be there and you didn't have to sell it off to pay for your care. So does that include like for insurance, looking at uh, disability policies as well? If, Sometimes if you have that disability option. policies are there. I'm working with a young lady right now. God bless her heart. She's 31 years old and have 10 policies. I said, okay, we're going to fix this. <laughs> but I like that you did something, but we're going to fix this. And one of her fixes was having a disability policy. She's a mental health counselor. And, um, but the disability that she needs is, you know, they call it non-tangible work, right? Meaning that it's not really physical. She won't break her arm or something like that because it's work related. But now so many policies have what's called living benefits that you almost don't need separate policies in that way. Um, some may, it depends if you're an airline pilot or, you know, you're a welder, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, it, like you said, everyone's situation is different, but for the average person, you can probably get away with not having a disability policy with a lot of riders that are included in regular life insurance these days. Okay. Okay. Wow. That, that was a, a good discussion. I, I learned some stuff. I'm making notes here as we're talking. That's my favorite part of doing this podcast. It's just a, 
<laughs> education is what we do. Educational, intellectual, tourist, learning and sharing. I'm I'm all in. So this is I like intellectual tourists. I'm sorry, but I gotta write that. <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Go for it. And while you're writing, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but I want to make sure we cover it. How can individuals adjust their financial legacy plans? Say you have a plan, you've implementing it, you're working it, and then the unexpected happens, such as job loss, uh, a worldwide virus, health issues, economic downturns. How, how do you adjust it without destroying it? Get in touch with the person that put the plan in place mm-hmm. and let them know that there's been some changes. Uh, I reach out to clients, you know, at least two, three times a year to see if there's been any changes. Many times, if there is something that happens, you know, we need windows or like you said, I'm out of work for a year because of the virus. What can I do? Many of those plans had benefits or flexibility that allows you to have a break. I got an an email from Nationwide saying, hey, if the clients are under hardship because of the recent floods in Florida, they don't have to pay their premiums for two or three months, right? So Mm -hmm. insurance companies are now a little bit more, and investment firms are now a little bit more flexible when it comes to helping, because they don't want people's policies to lapse or for them to lose certain benefits. But I think many times people just get, one, embarrassed that they're in that situation, Mm two, desperate because they feel they need the money, whatever that premium is or whatever they're saving, uh, putting away. But you never stop. You, you can't. That's that's the fun for later. It's like putting the mask on you first. Mm-hmm. Uh, because when that time comes where you'll need that money and it's not there or you'll need that benefit and it's not there, then it just opens Pandora's box. Gotcha. But one thing you can always do is talk to the person that put that in place. And you should probably reach out to them a couple times a year anyway to make sure that they're still there. Mm-hmm. I've had clients where a woman's son, um, Their company closed down and got rid of all the agents, and uh, she thought the policy was still in force. Unfortunately, um, her son passed away of a disease a month after his policy expired. Wow. Wow. So he couldn't even get care when he was in a terminal state, which would have been covered under the type of policy he had, but she didn't know. We put these things in drawers and we forget about them. Weren't they making monthly payments? I mean, you don't really get a policy paid up. Where was her money going? Yeah. Good question. Oh, Lord. Good question. Mm. Good question. It's it's unfortunate, Dr. Mo, that um, you have a lot of transactional business in the financial services world and transactional doesn't help people. It just gives them a solution for right now. But when you're working with someone who's going to work with you on a real plan, Mm -hmm. and now you've built a relationship and that's who your go-to person should be. Okay. I'm getting off track now. I had a light bulb moment. I didn't know I needed to check all these companies now. Uh, Granted, because I'm in corporate healthcare, you know, my employer, we're dealing with some pretty big companies, but I have, you know, some things on my own as well, because I never put all my eggs in, in one basket. I, I think that's another mistake people make because they let people go all the time, you know, and then Cobra is a, whoo, Cobra is a bear, but that company was no longer in operation. So I need to be checking. How do you check on financial services companies, insurance companies? I mean, the website could have still been up. I, I don't, I just realized I don't even know how to do that. How do, how do you check and make sure that they're active? Is there a rating like AM best? There are. Or? So there's a couple things. Uh, number one, it's unfortunate, but whoever put your plans in place, you should have a business card and be able to reach out to them. That's the first thing. Um, And then you just ask them, I just want to take a look at my plan, see how it's doing. I get these statements, you know, what's what's happening now? Should I make changes? And, you know, here's where my life has been and here's where I'd like it to go. Do you have any suggestions or recommendations? That's number one. Number two, to check the status of an account is 
not the account, but the company rating, Mm -hmm. that's all you have to do. All of the companies I represent, over 150, are all A-plus rated companies. Mm -hmm. And what that means in a sense is um, under our brand, these companies have to have two or three of the amount of the coverage in reserve for every single account out there. So if your account is a $100,000 account, then they have to have 300 in reserve specifically for yours. So if they go belly up, your account is still okay and protected. Um, and that's how you can find out what their rating is. Is Okay, you know, but, but with, with who? Like I know Dun & Bradstreet, Moody's, who, they're rating with whom? Who, what is the organization that rates them? You can check with uh, Moody's. Uh, the other one is um, the S&P. They'll be okay. ranked on there as well. Okay. And you can ask uh, even Google, as much as I hate saying check Google, but it's probably the quickest way to ask what is the rating of, let's say, a nationwide company. Are they A plus or B minus? Okay. And you definitely want to have, oh, I'm sorry, in a relationship with a, 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 a A plus or A plus plus company. Gotcha. Gotcha. That, gotcha. that secures your financial security right there to know that you're dealing with someone that's really reputable and that their financial stability, that's all that rating means is the financial strength of that company. Okay. One more question. We're getting short on time here. I've just rambled. You just got me all excited about going to look at my financial legacy plan now. But, <laughs> but that's what you should do. That's, that's what you should do. And that's what we're here for. Oh, trust and believe. <laughs> Final question before we talk about okay. your wonderful products and services. Studies, study after study shows most of us do not save enough money for retirement or long-term financial consi- uh, security. We, we've talked about this a little bit as well, but what are the key factors individuals should keep in mind when planning for their retirement and how they can ensure they're on track to meet their retirement goal? Now, I know you've Ooh. said to You need a good relationship with your planner, but are there any other factors to consider? First and foremost, save more now. Save more now because you're in your income earning years now. Mm -hmm. You know, some clients will start with, well, I just want to save the bare minimum and then I'll pay, you know, save more when I make more. And that's fine for people who are in that financial position, Mm -hmm. but to ensure that you are on track and, you know, it always, goes without saying is, you know, live below your means, right? Right. Live live below your means, but plan for how you live. Um, If you like going out once or twice a month with friends and, you know, going to events and things, you can plan for that. But in order to make sure that your financial plan is going to be stable and get you to where you want to be, like number one, like you said, don't put your eggs all in one basket, but most importantly, to make sure that you're consistent. Remain consistent with your savings because that has to come first. I can't tell you how many people I have to cut their dining out bill by a third. And that's an extra four or 500 bucks a month that we can kind of put in this bucket if mm-hmm. you stay out the drive through. Wow, that's significant. $6,000 a year. That's, that's, that's pretty significant. You don't need the rule of 12 or anything to figure out. You can do a lot with that. Uh, you can do a lot with that. You can, and then people start to penny pinch as well. You start to pay attention more when, when you're in a good habit of saving and you have your financial future in the forefront of your mind. Mm-hmm. You start to think about when you're spending more money. You're like, mm, no, I can't go out this weekend. Maybe next week. Right. Week. Really, yeah. though? Maybe I will use my Instant Pot and cook and, <laughs> and eat that chicken and rice for three days so that I can do, <laughs> you know, I can continue and eating chicken and rice 20 years from now. Yeah, repurpose the meal. Repurpose the meal. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> hey, tell us about your, uh, you You mentioned some of your clients and, and I'm sure you're just great with them, especially if you're reaching out three and four times a year. I'm going to have to talk to mine. As a matter of fact, we, I'm making a call tomorrow. <laughs> but yeah. tell us about uh, your coaching practice, your books, and, and how folks can get in touch with you, Laura Finney, oh, yeah. M-I-N-N-E-Y. <laughs> yes, yes. I um. I love what I do. You you heard it in the beginning where my passion for it comes from. It really is about the education piece, not about a transaction, because I don't know how I can help people um, until we've sat down and really understood what it is that you want. Uh, But what we do is we start with the financial literacy, and that's asking just a lot of questions about where you are now, where do you want to be, you know, three years from now, seven years, and what retirement looks like for you. Um, One woman said, I just like to go fishing. 
I said, well, where would you like to go fishing? She said, oh, up the creek, down the road, around the corner. I said, well, what if, what if you can go on fishing journeys, mm. like in Florida or in other parts of the nice. country or the world and having people think a little bit about dreaming bigger mm. and what they can really have and then show them how to get there. And having the stability of the companies that we re do represent from the Nationwides and the John Hancocks and, you know, the Vanguards and the Fidelities, all of these companies are individual to me as a broker, because now I'm not married to any of them. Mm -hmm. What I'm married to is getting my clients the results that they want so that when their time to retire comes or take off work or if an emergency happens, not have to worry about anything for six or seven months. That's that's what gives me probably the greatest joy right now is knowing that I did right by them in that way. Wow. And then um, the book, The Entrepreneurship Journey. So all of us have a little bit of a bug in us. Uh, mine existed probably since I was 19 and, you know, writing term papers for college students mm -hmm. and getting paid. <laughs> that was probably the biggest thing that made me realize I'll probably never be employable, you know, for the rest of my life. <laughs> I did have a career for, for a time. Um, but at 50, I realized how much I didn't know about money. Mm. I saw what happened with my grandfather's land, but it wasn't enough for me to sit down and, and figure out how not to let that happen to my children. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I was 50 and my cousin sat me down and said, hey, what are you going to do when you retire? And I was like, well, I don't even know what that looks like, but let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. and, and so from there, she was explaining all of these different scenarios. And I was like, why don't more people know about this, especially women, right? Women have a longer longevity of life than men, mm -hmm. but we have poor health than men. And that's probably because most women are caregivers to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. um, and we end up with some health issues, but having that passion of wanting to help and educate people, but then really want to like dig my teeth in the conversations with women about what we can be doing now, you know, be your own brand name, right? Yes. I like a good purse, but, you know, I don't want to fund their kids. Exactly. <laughs> Advertise for them <laughs> for free after I, I pay for the product. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. I believe to each its own, you know, I don't know how expensive a product is until I go pick it up and look at the price tag. It's not because it's a name on display. Mm -hmm. It's because, oh, I like that item. Oh, maybe I don't like that item that much. But <laughs> maybe I can find a different version, but there are some things that in life is just part of our lifestyle and that's okay. But meanwhile, let's just plan to make sure that we're not just living for today, that we can have some money set aside for five or 10 years from now to still live that lifestyle. Beautiful. And, and the book is available where? My book is called The Entrepreneurship Journey. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 11 short chapters. I think it's like 57 pages in this book, but it's bite-sized pieces on things. Entrepreneurs, no matter where you are, if you're in the early stages of, you know, starting a business or you're a seasoned veteran, it's right. the tools and tricks and trades of the business of business as an entrepreneur that we should be focused on uh, that many of us sort of overlook because we're in the business of running these businesses and, you know, building this legacy to happen right. for us. And then we forget about some key things that you know, can hurt us down the road, but they can go to Laura Finney Enterprises. And I think my name is there. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, mm -hmm. enterprises with an S dot net, N-E-T, right. Laura Finney Enterprises dot net. And, uh, and the book is there. So I hope that they'll, you know, get interested in, and pick it up. Absolutely. Laura Finney dot net. We will, Laura Finney Enterprises dot net. We'll be sure and drop that in, in the show notes so they can go write to it and learn more about you. This has been wonderful. And I already know I need to have you back so we can do a whole show on living beneath your means, living within your means, not beneath, but living within your means. Cause I, I think a lot of people don't get that a bunch of credit card debt is not living within your means. So <laughs> that's just kicking the can down the road. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Laura, thank you. Thank you. This has been informative and interesting. Thank you for sharing your expertise, your personal story, and thank you listeners for your time. I hope you enjoyed the show and invite you to subscribe, like, and tune in each week. Until next time, be well and be safe. 
And wasn't that a great program? Oh, love that episode. I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share. Learn more about me on my website, drmoanderson.com. That's M-O-E. You can read book excerpts, watch videos, learn about my services that I offer, and book me for a speaking engagement. I'd love to talk with your group, and I'd love to work with you. So until the next time, review, renew, and re-you. Thank you.